There's a hot new restaurant that opened up focusing on locally sourced and seasonal ingredients. This is The Kitchen Table in Albany. The Kitchen Table is located at 300 Delaware Avenue in Albany, just outside of downtown and right near the Spectrum Theater. According to the values posted on their webpage, the main focus of executive chef Ian Brower is to highlight regional harvests to create seasonal menus for elevated, casual, fresh cuisine. Cassie and I had the opportunity to dine there on a moderately busy Saturday evening. Our dinner for two was over $100, including drinks, appetizers, main courses, and desserts. And what we experienced was very interesting. We're gonna get the big elephant out of the room really quickly here. The kitchen table is located in the former location of New World Bistro Bar at 300 Delaware Avenue in Albany, New York. This was a restaurant owned by Annette Nains and her husband, Scott Meyer, notable because local celebrity chef Rick Orlando used to cook in the kitchen and most of the recipes were his. And that operated like that for over a decade, I think since 2009 until around 2019. Now under new ownership, the kitchen table has executive chef Ian Brower leading the helm. And he's worked in the areas at places like Capital City Gastro Pub, Peck's Arcade, Donna's in Troy, and Lost and Found. And we've eaten in all of those places while Ian was in the kitchen, so we're pretty familiar with his food. It's clear the new vision for the space is looking to preserve as much of the former spirit and push the farm to table ethos. I mention all the history so that it's noted here, but I'm not gonna harp on any of that because I do get the impression that the new vision looks to move on from the past. Peeking around the restaurant, the layout has been preserved. Tables seem to be spaced out a little more than before, but I think that's more of a product of the public health situation over the last couple years than anything else. The decor is fun and modern, and we had a little bit of a chuckle about the little wispy leaves that were decorating right next to our table. All this is cool and all, but being that this was a couple's night out, we really wanted to toast the occasion with a nice cocktail. The drink menu has a bunch of local beers and wines, a lot look pretty familiar, and also some really creative mixed drinks. The drink that I ordered was called the Queen of hearts. Kenzie Rye, Pellegrino Amaro, Lemon, Simple Syrup, Red Wine. On paper, this sounded like it would be great. As I got into it and took some sips, I wasn't exactly loving it. And that's not at all because I stabbed myself in the eye with the herbs that garnished the drink. I think it was just a lot more astringent and dry than I kind of figured it would be. And honestly, looking back, that makes sense because there was Amaro and wine in it. But that was okay because Cassie wasn't exactly loving her drink, which was the doctor's orders. Agave spirit, lemon, ginger honey syrup, orange marmalade, vanilla mezcal. So we traded. I liked this drink a lot better and Cassie liked the one that I had a lot better. So our little drink shuffle worked out. And with that, we had to decide what to eat. In addition to local cheese plate and house-made charcuterie, there's two sections to the menu, essentials and offerings, both of which have a mix of small and large plates. And there's even a statement on the offering side saying that the plates are listed from small to large, which is really helpful for somebody like me who likes to order the biggest thing on the menu usually. <laughs> But we did settle on one appetizer from the essentials and one from the offerings, but there was a little bit of a snag. I had my heart set on the pickle plate, but without any additional description, Cassie flagged the potential opportunity that some of the components on this pickle plate would be cauliflower. So I had to ask the server and it ended up actually being true. So that was off the kitchen table, so to speak. But we settled on the fat olives, which were described as gordial olives with rosemary and orange. and David's focaccia with rosemary and garlic. Between what I was gonna have as my main dish and what Cassie was gonna order, we were kinda going for this Italian dinner vibe, but that didn't exactly work out, which I'll talk about when I get to talking about the dinner and the menu. These fat olives were pretty interesting, but nothing really outstanding, and that's not to say it's a bad thing at all. Thinking about it, there were two things I actually loved about this. First, that they serve these dried little orange rinds along with the olives mixed in to kind of break up the bites a little bit, and also that they serve this in a teacup on a saucer. One thing that season three of Curb Your Enthusiasm established is that olives on the table as an appetizer or a snack are problematic, because where do you put the pits? I just love that this place is putting a flag in the sand and gives you a receptacle for the pits. Pretty good. The focaccia wasn't particularly noteworthy. Exactly what you'd expect from a fluffy, oily focaccia at a restaurant like this. Pretty good. 
pretty, pretty good. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to hit it with a like and subscribe if you like food. Cassie was gonna order the pappardelle with pork ragu, pecorino, and marjoram. And everything was locked and loaded, but then the server came back to let us know that the last plate got sold to the table right next to us. Bummer. She ended up settling on the beef kebab dish with horseradish, yogurt, and quinoa, which when that finally came to the table, I thought was served in far too small of a dish for what it actually was. That's neither here nor there. Being that I usually research the menu online before I eat at a place like this, I was hoping that the porchetta that they had on the menu online would be available that night. It wasn't. And it seemed like the menu that we had in hand had a lot of the same components in dishes that were in the menu online, but kind of reconfigured and shuffled around. And that also is neither here nor there. For the purpose of dinner that night, I got the house-made parsley and pecorino sausage with braised spinach and buttered parsnip. In my dad's store, we used to make amazing cheese and parsley sausage. So I figured this was gonna be a really nice, comforting, nostalgic dish. And it was. <laughs> Let's get the description of the sausage out of the way really quickly here because there's really no good way to do this. It was super plump and juicy and flavorful. Usually cheese and parsley sausages are actually nice and thin, but it was quite surprising to get this as a nice big fatty. The parsnip puree was very simple, very rich velvety texture. Between the butter inside and the drizzle of olive oil outside, this is one of those things that totally coats your mouth as it goes down. As far as the spinach, there was a lot of spinach on this, and I'm talking about like a comical amount, like almost one and a half cups of cooked spinach, which to start was probably, I don't know, five to eight cups of spinach before it cooked down. It was braised and seasoned really nicely and had these nice little toasted nuts on top that kind of helped bring a little bit of crunch to this dish because it was a lot of kind of smooth textures. Taken together, this was a really solid dish. This was served in kind of a larger bowl, which I guess I'd argue would be the right serving vessel for this. Honestly, if this were served on an even larger plate, it might help the perceived value. And I think that parsnip puree would actually hold up. I don't know. I think part of it too is the tables are kind of small, so trying to economize the space is probably what they're going for here. We did leave room for dessert, so you know we had to partake that evening. The dessert menu was small but mighty with just four items. Between the flourless chocolate cake, barbarone, apple galette, and pot de creme, I decided on the barbarone which was described as our daily bread challah, whipped mascarpone, candied walnuts, and salted whipped cream. This sounded really creative and rich, which I'm all about, so I had to try it. When it came out and I inspected it, and then when I cut into it, I hadn't realized how like thick and candied this toast was. It was literally like a giant hunk of French toast. I tried to snag a bite with all the components, and as I ate it, of course, got the obligatory puff of powdered sugar all over my black t-shirt. Kids. This was totally incredible. Outside, the toast was crispy and crunchy. Inside was nice and soft and kind of had a barely eggy texture to it. The whipped mascarpone was very simple and luxurious. Candied walnuts helped bring a little bit of crunch. I liked it. I don't think mine had the salted whipped cream. I could be wrong, it could have been mixed in with that mascarpone. But honestly, even if that was straight up mascarpone, sometimes just whipped mascarpone is enough on your dessert. I really love that I'm able to get back out there and eat inside of restaurants again. Check out our last couple's night out where I had a giant Mexican Oaxacan feast right here. <laughs>